Um, uh, thank you to MDE Net for uh, inviting me to give a, a talk about one of my favorite formalisms, uh, languages, um, Modelica. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, an introduction, it's very much an introduction uh, to equation based object oriented modeling of cyber physical systems with Modelica. So that's a, a very long title, and I will go over each of these aspects uh, over the equation based, over for the object oriented uh, and why it is suited, uh, this language Modelica, this modeling language Modelica is suited for cyber physical systems. Uh, let's not forget, and this will keep coming back, that what we're doing is modeling. Uh, we're building a model of a real world entity in a certain context, within that context, we're modeling it. And we're interested in certain properties of interest and others we are not interested in. And uh, we replace real world experiments by virtual simulation experiments. And of course, uh, we want this model to be valid, uh, which means that uh, not just the simulation results, but the derived properties of interest actually are close enough together. Okay, this will keep coming back because uh, it's all very well to do modeling. Uh, it should be meaningful. Our models should be valid. So um, this presentation is about a language called Modelica. Um, it's a language which has gained exponentially in popularity. It is quite suitable for modeling um, cyber physical systems, um, which contain network components, informational components, physical components. Its main purpose is to model physical uh, systems at a, a particular level of abstraction called lump parameter abstraction. Okay. Um, one of the reasons I may be a good person to give this talk is because this is me in my younger years. This is the Modelica design team. Um, uh, this is, for example, um, Hilding Elmquist, who is really the brain behind all of this, because in 1978 at Lund University, he designed a language called Dimula or Dumula. Um, which was, to my knowledge, the first equation-based object-oriented language. Uh, Peter Fritzson is the, the man behind Open Modelica. I'm going to use Open Modelica and the, the tooling around it um, uh, in this presentation. Okay. Uh, so here's uh, his thesis, a structured model language for large continuous systems. So at that time, it was mostly focused on modeling physical systems using continuous uh, models, continuous time models. Okay, um, there are today many tools such as GPROMS, 20SIM, VHDL, which is a and uh, hardware description language, digital hardware description language, but there is the analog extension, AMS, uh, Ecosim Pro, uh, Simscape, uh, Siemens uh, Sim Center Amosim or Amosim. They all support either directly Modelica or some similar equation based uh, modeling. Okay. Uh, there is a vibrant community. Uh, this conference, I think, is no longer uh, organized, but it shows that the, um, there was an interest in equation-based, object-oriented modeling languages and their supporting tools. Uh, so not necessarily Modelica. Uh, there is a whole family of such uh, formalisms. And Modelica itself, as I said, has really taken off. Uh, there have been now up to now 15 conferences with a growing number of uh, participants. Okay, now, before I run out of time, I want to point you to some other references. Uh, if you, after this talk, are interested in this topic, um, we edited a book uh, on foundations of multi paradigm modeling. And one of the chapters was written by Peter uh, Fritzson, uh, who built Open Modelica. And it really introduces in a very compact way it introduces the language, but also what is interesting for us computer scientists what happens behind the scenes, how causality assignment is done sorting is done and so forth. Peter Fritzen is, a, after all, a computer scientist. Now, uh, the ultimate reference is, of course, Modelica, the website modelica.org, where you also find uh, the normative uh, documents. And there's also a tutorial there. Open Modelica, the tool I will use, is easy to download from this website. 
And I must say, I'm a big fan of Mike Tiller, uh, who has this wonderful online uh, book on Modelica by example. Uh, so I, I think if you want to start, uh, this is a very good starting point. Okay. So uh, this is an overview of my uh, of the things I want to show you, and I'll um, I'll start with something we know: procedural code functions. Um, and uh, because Modelica also supports procedural uh, uh, code, sometimes this is useful. Um, and then we jump into the the meat of it, uh, which is equation based sometimes called a-causal modeling, where we move from programming to mathematics. I will give a word of warning about numerical approximations. Then we get into the other parts of equation-based object-oriented modeling, namely the object orientation and how that comes in. And of course, as we know, one of the reasons for object orientation is to structure and to reuse. Uh, so that brings us to library, building libraries and the uh, Modelica standard library. Um, and uh, well, if I claim we can model uh, cyber physical systems, well, there's also the cyber part, and we know that is not continuous time. This is discrete time or discrete event. And I will go a bit more into the the, the essence of the difference between if and when, when is what allows us to make this link with the discrete event world. And I will come back to that figure of model versus system um, and this virtual experimentation. I will talk about model calibration. I'll give a small example of controller modeling. And this is a lecture in its own right, uh, namely the link with co-simulation and in particular um, the FMI standard. But that is actually another lecture, uh, but I hope to be able to uh, make the link. All right, let's jump in. And rather than looking at the slides, uh, we will jump into Open Modelica Editor. This is an interactive environment. And I've built a, a couple of models. Um, this, as you see, is in the language Modelica. Um, it's uh, uh, actually in the language Modelica, everything is a class. And then you have some restricted classes, um, such as model. Um, um, such as port and, and so forth. Uh, so a function is a restricted uh, class and uh, it has in it an algorithm. Now this algorithm is really, uh, and it has a name, uh, some uh, yeah, string to describe it. And then that name reappears here. I think this was also the case in Modula uh, that you end with an end and then the name of whatever this block uh, was. Now, the way we define functions you don't see any return values here. No, we explicitly describe what are the inputs and what are the outputs. In this case, there's only one output, but you could have an arbitrary number of inputs and outputs. And so we have an integer n, we have an integer k, and we have a result. And it's a very simple uh, algorithm. It's basically we assign to result if n smaller than or equal k, then we return 2n, else we return 0. Okay, uh, it doesn't get uh, simpler than that, and it's pretty useless. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that there is a colon equals. This is really what you find in programming languages, traditional programming languages. You have a right-hand side expression, which leads to a result, uh, or to a value, which is then assigned to a uh, left-hand side. And there's a single left-hand side. Okay, uh, so we're all comfortable with that. Now I'm going to use this in the context of Modelica. Now I'm going to look at the Modelica model, and I've called it procedural code. And now you don't see uh, an algorithm anymore, you see an equation. And actually, you see now that integers uh, here, the integer sum, I've given it a start value because Modelica is all about modeling dynamic systems. It's not about modeling structure. It's about modeling the dynamics of systems, of how systems and their descriptive variables, their state variables, evolve over time. Now, you could argue that there is also some evolution. Eh? You could say this is the trace semantics of executing uh, statements, and the variables also change. Uh, but here, 
it's really, this is really the essence of Modelica that, for example, when I say integer as a type or real as a type, this is actually the type is a mapping type. It maps the time base, which is the real numbers, onto an integer value. So sum is not just an instantaneous value. It is actually a function of time. It's an integer value at any point in time. Okay, so let's bear that in mind. This will become more natural when we start looking at truly continuous time um, models. So um, what I'm doing is I have a parameter uh, k, which I'm going to pass here. Uh, we're going to call this um, times two up to k. I'm calling that function. And uh, I'm also, this int time is the, because time, you don't see it declared. This is this is there in the um, the core of the Modelica language. That is this uh, time variable, which is a continuous variable which increases um, up to a certain point, which we will have to specify the termination condition of our simulation. We will have to specify here in our simulation specification or our experiment simulation experiment specification. So all I'm doing here is I have equations. Uh, and I say this is the integer version of time, and then sum is this. Let's run this. Uh, so I'm going to say until what time this must be run, until time 20. Uh, okay. And I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm still looking at the wrong thing. Uh, yes, uh, I see that the simulation, uh, some things happen behind the scenes, and uh, I can uh, ask to plot the value k, uh, the value int time, and the value sum. Um, and what we see here, I um, don't know what that green remnant is doing here. Oh, I think I know. I have selected something somewhere from another simulation. So now that has disappeared. So what you see is the time varies between 0 and 20 continuously. And as a function of time, we have the integer version of time, which is first 0, then 1, then 2, and it goes up to 20, ultimately. And then we have our fu function result, uh, namely this weird multiply by 2. So it's basically this red curve multiplied by 2. But once we hit uh, 10, then from there onwards, um, this function returns 0. OK. so. This is really an, a use of Modelica, which is, of course, uh, not what it's mostly intended for. But it shows that we can uh, call procedural code in so-called algorithm sections, as opposed to equation sections. Of course, the other uh, possibility is that, um, uh, let's see. Um, the other possibility is that, uh, as I said here, we could also just, in our Modelica model, call a compiled C code or compiled Fortran code. Now, th the fact that we had this colon equal here, and here we have an equal, is already an indication that here we have computational causality. We have the right-hand side is computed, and the result is put in this variable result. Whereas here, these are mathematical equations. So now I'm making the jump to mathematical equations. And if I go back to my example here, um, let's do this. And immediately, you will notice that this is no longer possible in a programming language. We just say the sum of both, it's a constraint. Sum minus time to up to k equals 0. OK. Um, I don't know which is known and which is unknown. I'm going to save this, and I'm going to simulate this again. And yeah, we get the same result. So somehow, um, Modelica is able to deal with implicit equations. So you might say, that's not special. I know some numerical techniques to solve this. It turns out that most tooling for Modelica does this in, an, uh, in a symbolic way. It uses computer algebra to go from a mathematical description to something which can be uh, executed as a, as a program, a traditional program. OK, now um, next, um, OK. 
I've already made the jump into equation-based A-causal modeling. And I've already mentioned that A-causal really means computationally A-causal. I can write an implicit equation and another implicit equation and another implicit equation. It is up to the Modelica compiler to figure out what is known and what is unknown, to propagate the knowns, to determine how to rearrange the, uh, the equations uh, and so forth. Okay, uh, let's uh, have a look at another example, namely a simple ordinary differential equation. Remember that I told you that a real does not mean that X is a real. It means that X is a function of the, the time base, which is real, and the value of X is also real. And here I started at value one. That's the initial condition. And uh, y starts at value two. And now I have an equation. Actually, I have two equations. The derivative with respect to time of that unknown function x, the only thing we know is that x at time zero is one. The derivative, uh, the rate of change, the slope of that curve, the derivative minus the value at any point in time y, uh, at any point in time, the derivative of x at that point in time minus y at that point in time must be zero. Of course, I could also write it like this, no? Um, and maybe uh, if x is a position, then then y would be the, uh, probably we would write v. Uh, let me uh, rewrite this. Um, v uh, would be a velocity. Um, and here another implicit equation, v minus two equals zero. Somehow, let's do this a little bit more in detail. We will check the model. Uh, and I've, um, and, uh, yeah, this is just a warning. I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to instantiate the model and we see the same. Oh, yeah. So here, this is not so spectacular, this instantiation. But if I then ask for simulation setup, I can ask until what time this will be simulated. I will also, I'm also able to say, which numerical technique will be used to solve this? Because not only will computer algebra be used uh, to massage the equations, to assign causality and so forth, but ultimately some numerical discretization will be needed. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, and finally, we can run the simulation. Um, yeah, that has now happened. And let me now go back to, well, I can create a new, Oh yeah, this is here my uh, my simple ODE. The V is constant. Remember, V minus two equals zero. So that means V equals two. And what is the function F whose slope is two, whose derivative is two? Well, uh, it's uh, this function, uh, sorry, uh, X. It is this function. It's a function with a, a certain slope. Okay, so it seems that uh, my equations can be solved by Modelica. Of course, uh, this is equation-based modeling, but let me look at a, maybe a, a more interesting equation. It's called the harmonic equation. And here I have used X and V. And I'm going to uh, say that at time zero, uh, X is one. And at time zero, V is zero. Ah, and the relationship between the two is that the derivative of x with respect to time is v, and the derivative of v, which is hence the second derivative of x, equals minus x. Ah, okay. Uh, I don't know if you know what the solution is. This has an analytical solution. Which function, if we take its derivative twice, gives the original function, but with a minus in front? Ah, it turns out that is a sine or a cosine. The derivative of the sine is a cosine. The derivative of a cosine is minus the sine. Uh, but the same is true for a cosine. So the, the general solution is actually um, x of t is going to be uh, is going to be a uh, sine a times sine of t. This is what we know from mathematics, uh, b times cosine of t. But of course, given that at time uh, zero, it must be one. 
x at time zero must be one. Ah, uh, but at time zero, sine of t equals uh, zero, cosine of t equals one. So uh, we know that the initial condition is that it's one, but we also substitute in the previous equation. Uh, we see that that is b. And uh, if I continue like this, the derivative, of course, of x, v of t is going to be, the derivative is a times cosine of t uh, plus, uh, no, no, minus b star sine of t. This is just my mathematics knowledge that I'm using. Ah, and we know that v at uh, time zero, the initial the start value, is uh, zero, but that will also be equal to, uh, if we substitute zero in here, this uh, drops because sine of t is zero. So we get a times cosine of t and cosine of zero is um, one. So this is a. Ah, so now we know that the analytical solution, that's why I'm starting with this. I'm starting with something, a, a set of equations, mathematical equations for which we know the the solution analytically so x of t we now know is a times but a is zero plus b times and b is one so one time cosine of t okay so we have the solution and of course we know the um, we then also know the i hope i haven't made any mistakes um the um, we have the analytical solution why is this so important well, I'm going to now simulate this. And of course, I have to look at the right plot. Um, I made it already, but I, yeah, I can also start a new plot. So I'm going to start a time plot and I'm going to look at my simulation. Um, I have X, which is the solution. And as you can see, X is cosine of T. Uh, we know that uh, cosine of T um goes um from one at time zero and then at uh pi over two it's here at pi it's there oh but this is not right why is it not right it is not right because when doing my simulation we we have to be careful eh? don't fall in love with your model and certainly not don't believe your simulation results because even if the model is a correct model of my physical system like a pendulum uh this is a model of many things uh, in this case it's a, uh, the the model of an ideal spring or a harmonic oscillator uh, but yeah, in a harmonic oscillator, there's no friction. In my equations, there's no friction. There's no energy dissipation. This should give us a cosine. That's also what we saw here. I mathematically figured out that the solution should be this. And what we see is this. The reason is, of course, that behind the scenes, and now I will go back uh, to my settings, I have done a simulation up to time 30. 30 and I have used a particular numerical solver. Let me use another solver, Dussel, which is much more clever. And uh, oops, and now we get what we expect. We get a cosine. And if I look at its derivative, that is, of course, the same as the variable v, we get a sine. So that's what we expect. Actually, it turns out that what we are often interested in is seeing one variable as a function of another uh, variable. And so we want a parametric plot in which uh, one variable is a function of the other. Um, and and um, the time is implicit. And as is to be expected at the definition of sine of theta, if this is theta, is that the x is r. Uh, cosine theta and uh, y is r sine theta. So we expect a circle. And that's why this uh, set of equations is also known as the circle test. And now what, it gets interesting because if now I go back to my bad approximation, so I again uh, go to the settings um, and I go back to a very, very naive approximation, a numerical approximation, uh, approximation. And I do this with a very limited number of intervals. So 
Uh, I'll explain in a minute what I mean by this. If I run this simulation now, what you see is a spiral which goes to minus 2000. And of course, if we were to look at the previous plot, you would see that is, this is far from being um, an, uh, a sine wave. And so this brings us to this notion of what is called numerical stability. There is a system that can be in the physical world that become unstable, which means it becomes unbounded in its states variables. Uh, but not only can we have system stability and instability, we can also have numerical instability. So beware when you do numerical simulations, you do have to know what you're doing despite all the clever computer algebra uh, and numerical approximations that happen behind the scenes. If you don't know, well, a fool with a tool is an even greater fool. If you don't know what you're doing, you may uh, all of a sudden think, oh, my system is unstable. By the, by the way, the definition of stability is it stays within a bounded region of phase space. And you see here, this is becoming unbounded. Okay. Uh, what is the solution? Well, maybe you rely on the cleverness of some of these uh, numerical techniques. For example, I could use a slightly better one and I could uh, Runge Kutta, and I don't know if Runge Kutta is adaptive. Uh, you know. Let's see if this is better. Uh, this is already a bit better. And you see there are these predictor corrector methods which may deviate and then come back. Now, I'm going to explain very briefly because this is rather important. Otherwise, you get complete nonsense results. Very briefly, something you probably already know. If I have a diff an ordinary differential equation, uh, it's an in initial value problem. That is to say, we have the equation or equations, and we have an initial value at time zero. We know that x is this value, x zero. And we're interested in this curve, namely the x as function of time, which satisfies, in general, dx dt equals some function of x and t. Uh, as we have seen uh, here, uh, now I'm going to make, I need to make this larger yet. You see, that's exactly what we see here. I could rewrite it as equals this. Uh, it's the derivative of x equals some function of x. Well, x could be a vector. In this case, it's a vector with uh, the scalar variable x, the scalar variable v. Uh, you can extend this to vectors. OK, uh, actually, I could, uh, yeah, in, in which case I would write uh, uh, by preference in black, I guess. You could make this into vectors. OK. But what I'm interested in is this solution. What is the function of time x, the function x of time that actually satisfies this constraint or these constraints? And we can extend this to differential algebraic equations where we also throw in algebraic constraints. Okay. And uh, to give you an indication of the, um, the solution, we, we know that the derivative uh, which is the rate of change or the slope of x in that point of time, is the limit of delta t going to zero of uh, the value of x at a future time minus the value of x at the current time, and that divided by the time step delta t. But only if this goes in the limit to zero. And this only holds for ODEs. And of course, assuming that we're not using floats but real, real numbers. So that's another problem, of course, uh, that on a computer, uh, so lots of mistakes can be made. You can model your system wrong. You can do the wrong numerical approximation, and then you can even still get into trouble with the limited numbers of bits. Uh, you have a double floating point number, for example. Okay, but you see here, that's the, the mathematical definition. Now we do a mathematical approximation. We are no longer computing x. We're computing x approximate. Well, for very small delta t, uh, or for a very large number of time steps over a given interval, that is uh, what you see uh, here. Here you see the number of intervals. Of course, if I take the distance between start time and stop time and I divide it by the number of intervals, well, then, of course, I get that delta t. 
All right. Now, if I write this, it's all approximate, and I uh, I bring this to the other side, then I I, I can predict the future value at, at time plus the t plus delta t of x approximated as being the old one plus delta t times the right hand side of my equation. Ah, and this is of course usually much more sophisticated. This is what happens in numerical solvers. And this is the Euler approximation, which I used a few minutes ago. I used Euler. And of course, that led to horrible problems. Now, it turns out that uh, what you see here, the step size can also be adapted. You can imagine if I have a, a behavior that is changing very rapidly versus a very smooth behavior that uh, you will need a much smaller step size uh, to uh, keep the error in bounds. So that leads to numerical uh, techniques, which are called adaptive step size uh, techniques. And that's where tolerance comes in. But you see it's grayed out because Euler, the normal Euler doesn't do that, this adaptive uh, Step five. Now you you you're attending this lecture not because you want to learn about numerical approximations, but you want to learn about the language modelica. Uh, this is just to make sure you realize that there is no magic. There is something behind it: numerical approximations, numerical computation. So uh, be careful, um, and uh, be careful in particular in choosing the right solver. Now a very powerful solver is Dassel, uh, which is an implicit solver, um, which is quite robust. Um, but that is not a guarantee because everything I've mentioned now assumes that we have continuous, that we have continuous equations. The moment I start throwing in software, discrete event, discontinuities, uh, none of this holds anymore. And then of course the numerical mathematics becomes a lot more difficult and you can get very strange effects. Um, okay, I will say more about that too. Uh, so uh, I talked a bit about uh, what happens behind the scenes, numerical approximations, and now what you've all been waiting for, uh, object-oriented modeling. Object-oriented modeling, um, is there, uh, we, we know about encapsulation, information hiding, reuse, and so forth. Uh, and of course, the typical uh, features of object-oriented modeling or programming is that we have classes, we have instances of classes. These classes, uh, we may have interfaces, uh, we may have specialization in the form of inheritance, uh, and so forth. Um, let's see if maybe we can take this mathematical modeling, uh, equation-based modeling, and we can mix this with the nice things we know of object orientation. Of course, it's not going to be object-oriented programming. Let's have a look at um, an example. I'm going to build an electric circuit, uh, actually, and I'm going to use a visual modeling notation. This is what we want to do. We're going to have objects, which we're going to get from a, a, a library. And we're going to connect them. But actually, this is just a visual representation. The textual representation is still that I'm going to get from the Modelica electrical analog basic library. I'm going to get a, a ground block. OK, that's, uh, that's this block here. Yeah. And so forth. I'm going to get a resistor, a voltage source, and a capacitor. I'm going to get all of these. I'm going to instantiate these from a library. And then I'm going to give equations. But the equations are now, because this is a network of building blocks, I'm going to just connect the building blocks. I'm going to connect the ports, actually the pins of these building blocks of resistor 1 and voltage source. We're going to do the connection here between the positive pin and the positive pin. This is the negative pin. The open one is the negative pin. Uh, and so we, we describe the network, the topology. Uh, those of you who have used SPICE, this would be called the netlist. OK, now there's all sorts of annotations. Um, 
that uh, can be used. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, the, we can put in annotations, which happen to be understood by this tool, how to visualize this. And actually, once we look into the, the definition of a resistor, we will see there also, there is a description of how to visualize it. There is a, you could argue, this is certainly not optimal. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between a particular model and how it is visualized. You could say, I want multiple concrete syntaxes, but this was a choice that was made early in the, in the 90s uh, in the Modelica design team. It was easier to implement. Anyhow, that's not a good reason, of course. But um, okay, now this is the top-down view. That's where we will end up. But I will now start with the bottom-up view. Uh, you may remember I'm going to go in this library, and maybe I will actually do this via the slides because I've simplified it a bit in the slides. Um, and um, I'll come back to this later. Um, we're, we're aiming for this, but we're starting from here. Uh, just a moment. So we're going to start by defining types. Ah, um, time is a real. Of course, real and integer and Boolean are built in. And as I told you earlier, and I don't know where this slide 114 comes from, but beware, variables are signals. That's also why I can do dx dt. The, the differential operator, dx dt, takes a function and gives the derivative of that function. It is not something that can work on a single point in time. So you have to beware eh, that these types, uh, such as real, are really describing functions of time. OK. Uh, and that's why we can integrate and, and derivate, uh, der, yeah, calculate their derivative, derive them. Uh, OK. Uh, I can define aliases. Time is a, um, a real function, but there is also this notion of quantity and unit. And a clever Modelica compiler will check that the quantities work out and that the units work out and maybe do conversions or give you warnings. And final means that if you're going to use the type time, you cannot change it anymore. Yeah. Okay, uh, electrical potential, it's also real quantity is electrical potential, unit is voltage, voltage is a synonym for that type, and the electrical current is in amps, ampere. Uh, okay, so these are our types. And uh, if you look into, that's what I, I started doing. If you look into the Modelica standard library, there is, for example, electrical potential, and you see their type electrical potential is real and so forth. And there are typically, some annotations here it's not visualizable so there are no annotations and uh, and then here type voltage is electrical potential okay so we were starting from the bottom up we're starting from this basic type real all right and now in the physical world we know that a voltage in its own right does not exist a voltage is a so-called across variable you always measure it between two points you measure, for example, the voltage drop over a resistor, or you measure the voltage with respect to the ground. So, um, yeah, uh, there is a voltage, but the voltage always comes together with an across variable. This was an across variable with a true variable or a flow variable, which is uh, in the electrical domain current. Okay. Uh, and so we're, we're going to lump these two together in a conductor, and we call it a positive pin. And there's an, a voltage in there, and there's a current in there. And actually notice that our knowledge of physics, Modelica is really a mathematical equation-based object-oriented language. But thanks to this little keyword here, we can insert a little bit of physics. What is that little bit of physics? We know that in an electrical node in here, um, okay. We know that in a node, when things come together, that the voltages are the same. If this is connected here, this is connected here, this is connected here, the voltages are the same, but the currents sum to zero. If I have the right sign con the convention, that's why we have a positive and a negative pin. So what this basically means there is conservation. There is no storage. 
It's like if water flows in into a closed tank with a fixed volume, then what goes in must come out. If I have a number of inflows, the, the sum of the incoming flows will be equal to the sum of the outgoing flows. If that is not the case, then I have a compressible liquid or maybe uh, yeah, there is storage happening um, or there is a leak in my tank or whatever. So this Kirchhoff law um, is, um, is going to be used later on. Um, when we, uh, and where am I uh, here, is going to be used later on. Uh, for all variables that are connected that have the flow type. So this is a forward reference uh, to what will come. So now we have a positive pin and it's basically a record. Uh, it's, it's a structure uh, which always has a voltage part and a current part named V and I. Okay, of course, once we look in the Modelica standard library and we look into interfaces, uh, into the analog part of the library, analog electrical part of the library, uh, then we see pin, positive pin. Um, I should have started with uh, maybe with pin because a positive pin is, pin is just a special kind of a, a pin. And what you see here is there are uh, comments, uh, there are annotations, including documentation in HTML, so that can be automatically rendered. And here you see a pin actually is a rectangle with a certain filling and, and so forth. Of course, typically you want to hide this information. The, uh, the pin is basically a voltage and a current, uh, and that's it, wrapped together in a structure. All right. Uh, so now we come to a partial model. Partial model means it cannot be instantiated, abstract if you like, because it's not ready yet. It's just a placeholder for refinement. Uh, what is a one port? And this may seem a bit strange. One port, this has to do with, with power flow rather than with connection points. Um, it will have two electrical pins. So uh, remember our... Uh, uh, resistor or so, it has two uh, two pins. One is the positive one, one is the negative one. The positive one was a, an, uh, a solid, was visualized as a solid, small, uh, as a solid, uh, small black uh, square and the negative one as an, um, uh, as an uh, not solid, open <laughs> uh, square. And, um, but now comes the interesting part. We're going to say we're describing an electrical component. And we know that electrical components, they have interfaces, a positive pin and a negative pin. And of course, we know from the previous definition that uh, they each have a, a voltage and a current, a voltage and a current. And um, any electrical component, if we observe it, over its interfaces, these pins, there will be a voltage drop between these two, and there will be a single current flowing through it. Ah, okay. So these are variables, time, uh, time varying uh, values. And here we have the constituent equations. This is the physics. The physics says, well, okay, uh, what comes in goes out and is equal to what flows through it. That's a property of the current. The, uh, PI, uh, the, the positive ports current and the negative ports current are opposite. Uh, they sum to zero. Uh, so what uh, goes in, um, the, the, they're opposite uh, signs. And the voltage drop is the voltage we can measure at the positive pin minus the voltage we can measure at the negative pin. And of course we can do P dot V because uh, P is a pin and a pin has in it, uh, has in it a V and an I. All right, we're not yet there because this is not yet a resistor or a capacitor or an inductor or a voltage source. No, uh, but before I go there, again, the same. Eh? We have our SI uh, units, voltage. Uh, we have a positive pin, a negative pin, again, with annotations to describe how they are visualized, and we can hide this. And here are the constituent or constitutive uh, equations. 
all right. And then the whole thing, the one port is visualized like this. All right. Now, finally, we come to our model resistor. And the resistor extends one port. And it adds, and by the way, the way extension inheritance works in Modelica is very, very basic. It is basically copy paste. You take whatever is in one port, you paste it there, and you add whatever is here. Ah, huh? so we add a parameter resistance, uh, which has unit ohm, and we add an equation. We already had equations, eh? but now we just paste another equation, which is the essence of a resistor is that there is this linear relationship, at least when it's in a certain operating range, linear relationship between voltage, drop, and current. Ohm's law. And the beauty of this, of course, and that's uh, this A causality, the A causal modeling. The beauty of this is, of course, we just write it down like this, A causal, implicit. But if we want to write it as a program, we will have to compute. If V1, V2, and R are known, we can compute I. If V1, R, and I are known, we can compute V2, and so forth, and so forth. Yeah? But this is taking, turning something like this into something like this is taken care of by a Modelica compiler. So we work with computationally a causal equations. But you see the object orientation is coming in. Uh, we can encapsulate, uh, we can extend, uh, and so we can build these hierarchies. Um, so this is, of course, again, how it looks like in the, or what it looks like in the library. And in the library, you see there is actually uh, a notion also of um, ambient temperature. Uh, you see V is R actual times I. So the, the R that we give is then converted to the real R based on the, the temperature. All right. As I mentioned, uh, we have here a description of what the resistor looks like as a building block. And that is rendered like this. And in this case, this one does have a heat port. Um, and finally, we have the circuit. Uh, we instantiate our building blocks and we just make connections between positive pin, positive pin, negative pin, positive pin, and so forth. And now you can ask yourself, yeah, what does this mean, this model? And as a computer scientist, you can guess what happens. I may draw this, but behind the scenes, we have this textual representation. This representation gets parsed. And the first thing we have to do is expand inheritance. Whenever we have something like this, we will basically look up one port and we will paste it in there. OK, that's the first thing. <clears throat> then we will instantiate all the components. And for example, a resistor inherits from one port and so forth. <coughs> extends uh, from one port, so we had to expand the inheritance. Then we do the instantiation, but yeah, we have multiple uh, resistors with different, at every level of a hierarchy, unique names. So uh, we uh, have to flatten the hierarchy and uh, I don't know um, the, what, what is behind slide 114. I really don't know where that comes from. Um, it um, um, we construct unique names with a dot notation in this case, <clears throat> and then we expand the connection into equations. Ah, now it gets interesting. We will say that the voltage on this negative pin equals the same as the voltage on this positive pin. That's an equality. But uh, this and this, they are all connected. That means that all these currents that flow through there must sum to zero in a, such a connection. So we generate these connection equations. And that is it. And then we basically have one huge set of mathematical equations. <coughs> and uh, yeah, this is now not the example I have <coughs> currently. Uh, but you see, this is my network. I have uh, the visual representation. If I run this through the compiler, it actually builds this. It builds one big set of declarations, but you see now register.v, register.i, inductor.v, inductor.i, everything is flattened. And of course, everything has gotten a unique name. And when we come to the equations, we basically have all equations. 
we have both the equations which come from, in this case, the resistor with the right names in there. Uh, but we also have things like this. Uh, we have uh, the P and the N. Um, the fact that what goes in and what goes out, they have an, uh, an opposite sign. But I'm now looking for um, here, inductor N dot I plus sine input voltage N dot I plus ground one dot P dot I is zero, uh, equal to zero. That is this summing to zero. And remember why that equation was generated, why while doing expanding the connecting two equations, that sum to zero was generated. It was because current had the flow keyword in front of it. And that, by the way, is the only bit of physics knowledge that is in Modelica. So don't expect anything more. There are other formalisms like bond graphs, which know more about the laws of physics. Uh, this I'm going to skip, uh, so I'm going to go back. This is then, be but because we don't have the time for it, this is describing how uh, by bipartite graph cardinality matching, uh, we can actually do causality assignment. That is what the compiler does. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go in there. Uh, I'm going to go back to my example. So remember, this I may have drawn. It's a slightly different example. This is the textual representation. Of course, in the annotations, you have the visual representation. But let's try now to check this model. And everything's fine. And it tells me it has 24 equations. And 16 of these are trivial. Uh, and by trivial, we mean, I hope this is readable, uh, 16 are trivial, which means that they're just uh, A equals B. So they're, they're typically connection equations. So they can be thrown out. Uh, when we generate uh, simulation code. Or we, of course, have to keep our symbol table. But now I do the instantiation. And here you see this is my instantiated flattened model. All right. Uh, and now, of course, because uh, in this case, there are no derivatives even. Oh, no, there is, a, there is a capacitor. So there is a derivative in there because the constituent law uh, of uh, of a capacitor has a derivative in it. So it's a set of algebraic and differential equations. And now we are back to what I explained earlier. Uh, this now I can simulate. I have to say from when to when. I have to choose an appropriate solver and I start uh, simulating. Okay, I'm simulating, but of course this is the wrong um, the wrong plot. Let's go back here. I have my capacitor one. I have ground. I have my voltage source. Ah, my voltage source um, was V. This was my voltage source. We have 220 volt, a sine wave. That's what, how I modeled it. That's what's coming in. Now it turns out that this is a typical uh, filter. Uh, excuse me. This is a typical filter. There is a signal coming in, and we will measure here the voltage over the capacitor. And this will actually, it will let through the high frequencies, and the low frequencies will be attenuated. Uh, this is a, a, a high pass filter. OK, it turns out that that's what it does. Well, let's check whether that is indeed what it does. Um, I'm going to look at what comes out. I'm going to look at the voltage over. Um, over the capacitor. And you see, there's almost nothing coming out. Of course, if I then don't show the input, you see, it's quite interesting. It's actually attenuated 200 times. And it's also sort of declining. There's some dissipation uh, due to the resistor, I guess. And maybe there's even a phase shift. I don't think there's a phase shift because there's no inductor. All right, OK, uh, to go one step further, I'm going to go back to my model. I'm going to go to, um, ah, I'm going to go back to my experiment. No, I'm going to go back to my, what was I going to do? I was going to, to do this. I was going to say the frequency is not 50 hertz, but 5,000 hertz. OK, 5 kilohertz. And now I'm going to simulate again. 
And what we see now, and maybe I should uh, simulate over uh, longer. Longer period. Uh, why did I, yeah, but I'm only simulating to 0 0.5. So it's very strange that this I didn't try before. And of course it's bound to not work. I was going to show you that if I use a, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong place. Uh, the stop time is uh, 100. Ah, something is going wrong numerically, that's why. Uh, so what solver am I using? Okay, I should probably not go deeper into this, but it shows you uh, what kind of problems you can run into. Let me have a look at my settings. I am using Dassel. Oh, number of intervals, stop time 10. But it's strange because I still I get mm -hmm. I get some very strange effects and I have no clue why. I was going to show you that it really acts as a, a high pass filter and that high frequencies get through. Maybe I was a bit too ambitious with my frequency. Maybe that was already kilohertz or not. Let me have a look. Uh, 500 simulate ah that looks more like it um why because it's a very high frequency so i only want to simulate till time 0 0.05 and it's still too much i think ah no there we are uh and this is the Output voltage. Now I'm completely baffled. So as you can see, it's one thing to know how to model. Uh, it's something else to know uh, what the physics is. Uh, I'm not going to try and explain the physics. I'm going to uh, jump back uh, to my presentation. What happens is uh, when we compile our model, we actually get this component. It's actually C code that is generated. And it, it describes both the model dynamics and some symbol table. And you have to connect it to a solver. Uh, that's what I was doing here. Uh, here I was choosing an appropriate solver like Dassel. And I'm going to try one more time. It gives the same results. Um, I have to choose an appropriate solver. And then together, we get a simulator. So this is the compiled model. Of course, compiled to a level that it can be executed by a computer. Eh? So causality has been assigned and so forth. Uh, the solver basically sees in here, maybe it's clearer if I bring you back to this, what we do is we give this right hand side we give this to a numerical solver this is an example of a numerical solver it will keep calling this right hand side and it will keep computing new approximations of our uh, solution all right now maybe a little bit more in detail if you look at the details of uh, the compilation the Modelica compiler will generate C files. Okay, my uh, RLC network.c, my network functions.c, and then all sorts of helper functions, they all get compiled and then they all get linked together. Here you see them, I've compiled them, they're all .os and finally there is one single executable, my RLC network. And you can give it, even command line, you can give it uh, some parameters and it will simulate. 
All right. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we can, for example, uh, use an inline Euler um, and uh, we can get some statistics about how it was solved. If you use uh, Dassel, for example, it will tell you um, how many steps were taken and, and so forth, all sorts of statistics. And finally, you get your um, uh, you get your simulation results. So, but we've come quite far. Eh? We, we've made a, a visual model. We've used building blocks from a library. All of this, of course, uh, ultimately leads to a textual description, which gets parsed. Then we expand inheritance. Um, um, we um, in, instantiate. Uh, we resolve the connects. Uh, we use unique names that came first, then we do causality assignment, uh, then we do some numerical approximation sometimes in case of the inline, and finally we generate C code, and that C code is a linkage between a solver and the code we had generated, and finally this is what you get. You may mostly forget as a user behind what, what is behind the scenes, except that, of course, things may go horribly wrong, not either because you've built the wrong model, but also because of numerical errors. And of course, I mentioned the libraries. Uh, the library uh, is quite extensive. I would say that if we go to the Modelica library, there are blocks, in, there are units, uh, all the SI units are in there. Um, there are constants such as pi, and then we have um, computational blocks, mathematical blocks, uh, but we also have different physical domains, electrical, magnetic, mechanical, fluid, thermal, and so forth. Uh, so let's look into electrical. In electrical, we have analog, but we also have digital, we have batteries, we have machines, uh, and so forth. In the analog, uh, we have our interfaces, our ports, uh, and uh, sources. And then, for example, uh, we can go into the basic ones, uh, such as the resistor. And remember, if I look in the resistor, this is what I will find there. Um, OK, so we have this library. I should say this library, the Modelica standard library, the MSL, is quite complete. Uh, and um, it, it more or less covers uh, bachelor level physics. OK, um, and of course, it's it's open. You can uh, you can add more and more components to these libraries. And of course, that's also the business model of certain companies uh, like in the HVAC heating, uh, air conditioning and vent uh, heating, ventilation and air conditioning domain. Uh, there are companies that sell libraries and, and also customize tooling um, specifically for HVAC. OK. Uh, okay, so we have uh, we have a library, uh, and now we come to hybrid, uh, because maybe this cyber physical world is not really completely continuous, and even the purely physical world, maybe there are physical phenomena which we either don't understand well enough, or for computational reasons it would be too hard. Uh, to compute them at a continuous level. And I'll give you an example. Uh, my example, my favorite example, of course, is uh, the, I'll start with the unstable bouncing ball, so that will not really work. Um, I have a bouncing ball. And uh, the bouncing ball, when it is in the air, it is just pulled down by gravity. Uh, and we, we neglect friction. The moment it hits the ground, what really happens is compression. It's a very complex process. It depends on the material, of course, of the, let's say it's a rubber ball, it compresses. But because of that compression, some energy is dissipated in the form of heat, uh, which is given to the environment. But it's because, of course, of hitting uh, the ground. And then it bounces back. And now it has a little bit less energy. So its velocity will be reduced a little bit. Uh, and then it goes up again, and at some point it falls down again, and so that's how it bounces. Actually, let's try to model this. We will have a height, which is a real function in meter. We have a velocity in meter per second, and we have a restitution coefficient. We're taking a shortcut 
we're going to take this continuous process and we're going to make it into a hybrid model where we say, ah, the moment there is a bounce, uh, we will just flip the velocity and attenuate it a little bit. You see, uh, the old velocity, the previous velocity will be flipped, that's the minus, and this efficiency factor, this factor of restitution, coefficient of restitution, 0 0.8, will give it a little bit less velocity because of uh, the, the energy that has been lost. And we will, after that bounce, we will reinitialize the velocity, and from there onwards, we continue our continuous simulation. So it's piecewise continuous. All right, we have a parameter, uh, H0, which is the initial height, one meter. We have a, a, a variable, this was the type uh, uh, H, the height of type height. We have a velocity, which we initially set up at zero. That means we drop the ball. Uh, and the initial equation, which gets computed at time zero, it turns out that's a whole story in its own right, that initialization and the reinitialization of variables is very important because I may initialize my derived variables, but maybe there are all sorts of depending algebraic variables. I don't want to go and reinitialize those or initialize those. I will let my uh, solver do that. So that's why initialization equations are there. They're only computed at time zero. And reinitialization is also often an iterative process done after a discontinuity. We want to start simulating again. The equations are the velocity is the derivative of the height. And the uh, second derivative, uh, this is nothing but Newton's law, F equals MA. Uh, uh, the, so the force equals, uh, um, maybe I should scribble, no? Um, F equals MA. F um, F equals M A, but A is the second derivative of X dt. And of course, we know that the force that is pulling is also equal to minus M G. And this is the mass and that is this G. Uh, if these two have to be equal, then uh, this drops and we get uh, the second derivative of the position, which is this first derivative of the velocity, is nothing but minus g. Ah, and that's exactly, uh, sorry, where am I? That's exactly what we see here. That's minus g. I should have made g a parameter, uh, and that uh, it's a bit uh, strange that I've put this here. Um, now, I come to the essence. The essence of the hybrid of hybrid systems is if I, and I'm going to go back to my scribbles, if I have a continuous function and that continuous function, we want to know, okay, I'm going to do it with bouncing. I want to know whether that continuous function, it's h as a function of t, whether that crosses a threshold. In this case, the threshold is zero. That's why this is called zero crossing detection. We want to know exactly when this crossing occurs. This is not the same as saying I have a variable uh, um, above ground. Uh, and this looks at if h is larger than zero. Ah, OK. Uh, here we have true, here we have false. Uh, here it is larger than zero. Here is it larger than zero. Here it is larger than zero. And here it drops uh, to false because here it becomes lower than zero. Ah, OK. Uh, so maybe I should have done this in another color. Or maybe even better like this. We can actually see it. Um, so this here is if we say that above ground is a variable, if h larger than zero, then uh, true, else false. And this is evaluated at every point in time. 
the result of a when, and do I have some more space? I hope so. The result of a, ah, but of course, you can do this. The result of a when is something else. The when function will actually, the when looks for this discontinuity and it will be an event. So this is the link between something continuous and the discrete event will nothing happens and then there is the transition and then it continues. Whereas here, these are still continue. Well, it, there is a discontinuity, but these keep the same value. What we really want is uh, this is the uh, crossing or the, 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 in this case, the zero crossing that occurs. So this is an essential um, uh, addition to the language, which up to now only had continuous behavior. Now we say when h becomes smaller than zero, then we must reinitialize the velocity. So let's have a look. I'm going to simulate this. Uh, and of course, I think I, I'm going to look already at the... Uh... Oh, okay, no, I thought I, I had it here already. I just forgot to give names. I'm going to make a plot and I'm going to show uh, the height as a function of time. And I should have, for dramatic effect, I should have simulated only till time three. Well, let's do that. Uh, so pretend that you haven't seen the previous results. Okay, we have a bouncing ball. And of course, if you look at uh, H zero, that was this. If we look at the velocity, ah, that's interesting. The velocity is negative, we're going down. And then uh, there is a jump because we flip the negative velocity to a positive one, but the height below zero and the height above zero, if you look closely, you will see this is 0 0.9 times that. And so the velocity keeps going down in this sawtooth, um, um, in this sawtooth uh, pattern. So let's take the velocity away. Let's take this away. And let's go back to what I showed you earlier. Um, that's if we um, go to five, all of a sudden we see that our ball goes below zero and keeps falling as if it is in free fall. What is the reason? Well, again, this obviously is not what happens in reality. This is a side effect of numerical uh, um, of numerical uh, errors. Actually, remember, I should do this in blue. This is H0. This is the approximated, 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 approximated um, uh, value of the height as a function of time. This is actually what we're seeing, the numerical approximation. And so um, you see two things here. First of all, we will have to iterate between these two, we will have to do the exact, we will have to find the exact time at which this happens. But secondly, you see, this has become negative. We've overshot and uh, we need to detect this because otherwise we can, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we, we may end up in a situation like this uh, where the solver gets confused and it keeps going negative. So. Actually, let's have a quick look at a stable bouncing ball. The only thing we do is we check both of these. We check when the height goes negative and uh, the height is smaller than, even if it goes uh, negative, but too far negative, uh, then uh, we do the, the following. We say done is h smaller than minus epsilon. Epsilon is a very small value, 10 to the minus three. This is our tolerance. We say, if we see that's gone too low, uh, and this is basically what you were saying, seeing before, uh, if it's gone too low, then we say we're done. And then our reinitialization is not just um, that we're going to reinitialize V to an attenuated version of it. This is before the bounce and the a new version is going to be after the bounce. But if we see that we've gone 
too low, then we just set it to zero. And if I simulate this, of course, you will see that now this will disappear. Uh, okay, if I now actually open a new plot window and plot this, I know that's the velocity, the height. Now you see from here, we have the ball stuck. It's just lying there. Okay, so this was again showing you, we have this expressive power uh, of introducing, thanks to this when introducing discontinuities, uh, but again, with great power comes great responsibility. You know what you have to do, what you are doing there. You have to know what you are doing there and you may have to modify your model a little bit. And this is not nice, the fact that we introduce this because in physics that is not there. But of course, we're not working with physics. We're not working with perfect mathematics, symbolic mathematics. We're working with numerical approximations and that's what is coming through here. Okay. Let me now uh, go back to my presentation. We're almost at the end. I think I will make it, um, at least the things I wanted to say. Um, the first one I want to tell you about is um, oh yeah, workflow, model calibration. Uh, let's have a look. Um, this is a deceleration profile. It's data which is measured in the real world when you have a, a car and uh, you let it, uh, uh, all of a sudden you, you don't give any more throttle, you don't give it power anymore. And it, of course, due to uh, friction of all kinds of the wheels and of the air resistance, it will come to a standstill. So why am I showing you this? Because very often, many of the parameters in our models are actually not known. Sometimes you can you can weigh the, the car and you can say its mass is this, but that is actually also an experiment. Or you can buy a block of whatever and uh, uh, the supplier tells you it weighs this much. But very often you have to set up an experiment to then guess what the parameter value is. So this is one of the crucial things that should not be uh, forgotten when you model physical things, uh, physical objects. Uh, you may have to do experiments to calibrate your model. And that is, of course, what I meant by uh, here. A model may have to be tuned to properly, in a particular context, uh, represent the system. Uh, and so one of these kinds of tuning is parameter estimation. Now, this is an assignment of a an, uh, an, uh, personalized rapid transform. Uh, transportation system um, and it's it's self-driving and uh, well we we may have to first estimate some of its parameters parameters in the uh, in in the equations but why i'm showing you this is i'm interested not only in modeling the physics of this but i want an a controller i want a a controller which will try to make that personalized rapid transportation car will make it follow this velocity profile. That is to say, these are desired velocities. Now you must go at nine meter per second. Now you must go at eight meter per second. From now on, you must go at that um, uh, that speed and so forth. And the question is, of course, how do we do this? Uh, well, the answer is we will use a controller which will somehow determine what signals need to be sent to this uh, this car's engine to accelerate or decelerate. Yeah. Uh, this is something that occurs very often, and we typically use PID controllers, proportional, integral, and derivative controllers. I just want to show you, I'm going to load, I have already loaded this, train people. Um, you see, we have a number of parameters, including the mass of the people. Uh, you may have noticed here, that this guy is holding on to a pole. And uh, so we're not just interested in the motion of the car, but we will introduce some constraints. For example, the engine cannot provide more acceleration than a certain amount. The braking cannot be more than a certain uh, braking. Uh, the, that's a negative uh, acceleration. These are physical constraints, but we also have user constraints. The user does not want to throw up, 
because of too much acceleration, deceleration. Also, the user doesn't want acceleration, maybe the car is able to, doesn't want acceleration or deceleration, which will uh, pull the human away from that bar so much uh, that they have to let go in one direction and in the opposite direction, their head smashes into the pole. And so there are all sorts of constraints. And so the reason why I'm showing you this is this is a typical use of, of modeling and simulation. You have a system under study, you have a controller and you have some uh, design constraints and optimization constraint. So this, op this um, assignment actually asks to design an optimal controller so that if we take the equations of the train and the humans and of the control. We could also have modeled this in a visual way eh, by connecting building blocks. Um, this is the velocity profile I've put in there. And if I simulate this, I'm interested in, okay, let's add another one. Um, and now you see there are lots of variables, but I'm, for example, interested in the acceleration of the people. Uh, no, first I will show you the velocity. The velocity of the train is like this because the ideal velocity, remember, was this profile. Uh, and I'm, I'm showing you the, this is the error, the velocity of the train. And you see, we're trying to get there, but based on all the constraints, we're not actually getting there in time. And then we go like this, but it turns out that maybe by changing the parameters of my controller, I can make this work. Or maybe I use a different controller. I use a proportional, oops, sorry. I use a proportional integrating and derivating uh, controller. And this I will comment. This was just a proportional controller. The thing with this this kind of controller is it actually allows overshoot. And so if I simulate now, you will see we get faster, but we overshoot. And sometimes that's just not allowed. So overall, we have an optimization problem. How do I tune my controller parameters to get and as good as possible behavior of the train. But of course there are constraints. Remember the constraints are that, uh, let's remove this, let's remove this. And let's look at the acceleration of the train and the acceleration of the people. And here, some accelerations of the people are just not allowed. Um, um, and uh, so this is just one typical non-trivial example of the use of Modelica. Now, um, let me uh, finish uh, by going back to my presentation and uh, telling you one more thing that is hiding intellectual property. If I'm an integrator, like a car manufacturer, and my components have been modeled in Modelica or in whatever it may be, um, but these components have been modeled by my vendors of my components. That is their bread and butter. That's their intellectual property. So they will never want to give me their Modelica model. Or maybe it's a model using a completely different tool. So that's another problem. If they give me an Amasim model, a Simulink model, a Modelica model, how do I integrate these? Well, what we will do is we will generate C code. We will compile that C code. And uh, if that adheres to a certain standard, we can now build new models with compiled building blocks in them. And for example, Open Modelica is capable of generating such C code, standardized C code, following this uh, standard uh, functional mockup um, interface standard. They're called FMUs, functional mockup units. And uh, it can generate such code, so it can be used somewhere else, but it can also, uh, it also allows building blocks, which have actually are pre-compiled and have been, um, um, have been generated somewhere else. And here we have a little example of an environment model, a controller model, a body model. They're all modeled in different tools. Uh, 
um, yeah, if I know the equations of all of these, I can simulate and I get a certain behavior. Uh, but what if these are black boxes? If these are black boxes, we have the control model with its solver, we have the body simulator with its solver, we have the environment around this thing. And uh, this is an automated, ga automated guided vehicle nowadays, but it used to be a badminton playing robot. Uh, well, what do we do? We have these simulators, these black boxes, and we will uh, connect this to something called a master or an orchestrator, which has a master algorithm, which knows how these blocks are combined, but it doesn't know what is inside. And so we can co-simulate everything. Uh, okay, I think I have uh, managed to almost finish in time. I hope this was not too rushed. Uh, and I did manage to mention the link with co-simulation, which is an entire story in its own right.